On the morning of July 31st, 31st, 2005, the world woke up to the shocking news of the death of Dr. John Garam. Who killed Garam? Was it a pilot error, bad weather, or possible missile fire that brought the helicopter down? Join us as we discuss this and more on Beyond the Headlines. On July 30th, 2005, Dr. John Garang, leader of the SPLM SPLA, was killed in a plane crash en route to New Kush in South Sudan from Entebbe, Uganda. Almost two weeks earlier, he had been sworn in as the first vice president of Sudan, becoming the second most powerful person in the country. The world was shocked upon learning about his death, given that he was among the primary architects of the comprehensive peace agreement that brought an edge to the 21 year civil war between Southern Sudan and Sudan. We're joined today by Mr. Atem Guy de Dut, an economist and analyst. He's the editor in chief of the Northern Corridor Morning Post, an online based news outlet that focuses on politics, education, technology, and covers other relevant issues. For two years, you did an extensive investigation about events that led to the death of Dr. John Garam, and then published your findings in a report you titled, Secrets in a Flight Manifest, The Making of a Traitor. To start off, what motivated you to pursue this somewhat controversial and also sensitive issue? Uh, well, Eunice, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I think uh, the death of John Garang was uh, very painful moment for all of us as a country. And uh, that was particularly so because of the fact that it happened at a time when we were so hopeful. We thought things would change. We were going to become a, a better country, not just a better country because we had the opportunity to either become an independent nation, uh, but also because we knew that our country was in the hands of the right man. As far as we knew how we, you know, how he was able to lead us uh, in those difficult times. Now, when you sit back and start to imagine uh, the kind of pain we went through, you know, because when he died, I was in high school. And I remember, you know, uh, walking out of the classroom and I hadn't cried in years. And I found myself, uh, you know, tears trickling down my face and my teacher came through and she asked me, what's going on at him? I said, well, we've just lost our leader. You know what she said? What did she say? Leaders can always be made. I said, well, that's not possible. Where I come from, they come in a generation. I'm not sure about yours, but uh, it just happens uh, that the man we lost today was not just a leader. He was a leader who was able to do with very minimal resources for 22 years. You know, that does not always happen. And that happened in that way uh, because he had to make sacrifices. He had to make a decision that, you know what, instead of being an excellent professor somewhere in some Western nation, uh, you know, doing what he has to do, not because there's anything wrong with it, he chose that his path was with his people, that he was going to be a man who fight for them, who was able to articulate what the issue was with the Republic of the Sudan, what the issue was with the government, not the people, what the solutions could be. Now, if you find somebody who is able to look at things in such a manner as not being able to take sides immediately, you know, because we wanted South Sudan anyway, everybody did, but there was a way to do it. He was the only person who could articulate it, you know, because if you go on the negotiating table units and say, this is what I want, you know what the opposition will do? They will say, no, this is what you want, but this is what I'll give you. So if we asked for South Sudan, they would have given us something else. So John Ken was asking for Sudan, the Republic of the Sudan, which he called New Sudan. So that's what motivated me. Now, it's important for us to delve right away into the fascinating report that you wrote. So go ahead and start off from the first account of the investigation you started. Okay, um, at first, um, I think it was around 2018, 
uh, that I got in touch with heli um, Russian helicopters. Uh, they are the ones who sell the helicopters in the secondary market. They're not the makers, the makers are Kazan. Uh, so after quite a while, I, um, I got the information from them uh, about the seating arrangement in that helicopter because they did everything. Uh, they, you know, they did the helicopter, seating arrangement, and then they gave it to Uganda. With the Ugandans later, you know, they put their own brand name on it. I think AF605. So that's, that's the initial phase. But the actual investigation as to what happened was not done with the Russians. It was actually with the Ugandans. Yeah, I want us to go ahead and focus on why was uh, Garang in Uganda to meet with Museveni? They, the relationship with, uh, with, uh, between John Gering and Museveni was really that of, um, you, you cannot describe it as a friendship per se. It was more of, uh, if you are able to mishandle my enemy, then you are my friend. So it was more of a very circumstantial relationship. You do this for me, I do this for you. So it was not organic in, uh, in, you know, in, um, you know, in a way where uh, it's a friendship that you actually start slow and then it builds into something bigger and then you become you know, lifelong friends. It was more of, uh, okay, you are able to handle the LRA at the border. I am able to push the LRA out of Uganda. So you are helping me, I am helping you. Uh, so uh, I have never looked at, uh, actually President Museveni is a friend of John Gunn. So on that day, uh, the kind of conversation they had is very difficult to tell. They are the only people who know what they, you know, uh, the conversation was. You could say that it had something to do with John getting having, having just become uh, the vice president of the Republic. And Museveni maybe, he wanted to brief Museveni about what had just happened and what would be the bilateral relations uh, moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I would only walk with the presumptions that that's what happened. Mm -hmm. Now, how did John Garang get to um, Kampala? Um, John Garang landed, yeah, yeah. John Garang landed in the morning, um, but he did not land on a Ugandan plane. He landed on, I think, a saucer in his plane. And then uh, he was able to be taken from uh, there to, to Ruakutira. Ruakitura, uh, I beg your pardon. That's where the meeting was. So when they did the meeting, uh, uh, Jorgen was able to come with a completely different plane. Uh, you know, that's how he got to, uh, to, to, to Entebbe and then from Entebbe he was taken by uh, UPDF. Now, was it a one day meeting? It was a one day meeting because it went on a Friday. So it was, um, it was supposed to end on that day. But somehow they decided that uh, the best thing to do was for him to have, um, you know, uh, a sleepover. And then on Saturday that he was going to leave for Nick Bush. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, who are the individuals that accompany him on the plane? On the plane, uh, there's, there's a misconception that uh, other than John getting himself, he was accompanied by six other South Sudanese. So that makes seven mm -hmm. of them. But the truth was, uh, there were only five. So when they were doing uh, the, uh, you know, when they were doing the count, Saura made a mistake of saying there were six South Sudanese, other than John getting himself. But the actual count was, there was Lieutenant Colonel uh, Juma Ali Mayana Maju, there was the, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Ahmad Malwal, there was uh, uh, Lieutenant Deng Maju uh, there was First Lieutenant Oboki Obu Ramaybek. There was first Lieutenant Colonel Mayan Degum So there were five of them plus John Gering, that makes six. But you know the count, and, and that's, that's where it really is critical. Uh, somebody said there were six South Sudanese because they count John Gering as completely separate. There were six South Sudanese and then John Gering. You see, that makes seven. But the truth was, no, it wasn't the case. Where did the discrepancy come from? It came from the initial phase of, of, of the count, you know? Because when somebody was documenting this on site, they were saying that John Gering was there. And because John Gering was there, he was such a significant person, he was not even counted. Now, they were only counting six South Sudanese, but it was, it was six South Sudanese, including Dr. Okay. Gering. How about the Ugandans? So you had the pilot uh, who was actually Peter Nyakairo. Uh, you, you had Captain uh, who was the co pilot. His name was Paul Kimba. And then also Patrick Igundu, who was a flight engineer, uh, Sam Andrew Bakowa, uh, he was a protocol officer, 
and then you had uh, Lillian uh, Kabaije with the air hostess, uh, Johnson B. Manandura, oh, I've just had, had it here, was a helicopter jet officer, and then Corporate Hassan Kiza, it was a presidential signaling officer. Um, they had titles, but the truth was, these were professional soldiers. Now, did, it's quite interesting that um, given the relationship you just stated between Museveni and Garang, Garang went ahead and trusted the, pl uh, the plane being given to him. You know? mm. Why did he put so much trust in that? You know, I think, I think it's a mistake that was um, on John Garang himself as, as, as well as people who were close to him. Because uh, when you look at the relationship between Museveni and John Garang, it was a relationship based on, on um, was almost symbiotic. I get this, you get that. But there's also power dynamics that John Garang was now going to be almost, you know, second most powerful man in, uh, in, in Eastern Africa. Okay. Uh, that would be, of course, if you count other presidents, you know, you know, as, as a single unit. But if you look at uh, somebody like uh, uh, Yoweri Museveni, who was able to hold on to power for so long, the idea was that he had power in Uganda which of course, you know, with the nature of power, as you know it, you would be tempted to try and expand it a little bit more and say, okay, you know what? I, I have a little bit of influence in this region, you know, in this country and the next country and all this, but this is the other guy coming through. So what do we do? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the argument of some people I really respect that it might have been, uh, you know, um, out of sheer, you know, um, dislike, if you may for lack of a better word, uh, there could be something a lot more. Now, in your report, you mentioned that Museveni had used the same helicopter the previous day, you know, to yeah. fly somewhere. Yeah. And then it was revamped to accommodate yeah. Garang during his yeah. flight on Saturday. What yeah. changes were you able to find out that were made on the helicopter? Well, uh, according to Kazan, what they do is, um, you know, the helicopter has got two options. It can have 26 seats or it can have 12. But with, with, with this one, uh, with this MI-172, what they did was that uh, they did not do any functional modifications. The modifications were more of uh, very cosmetic. Okay, uh, where, where are the other seats going to go? Um, how many people do we have in there? How do we make it look a lot more better? According to people who were on site at the Entebbe airport on that day, uh, the helicopter, did, it was not just the fuel drums that were put into the plane. It was, it was redone in a bit. They cannot uh, specifically say what was modified, uh, but I can almost certainly say there were no functional modifications. Mm -hmm. And what would you term as functional modifications? Functional modification would be something like, okay, if you, if you get into the plane and, and, and change the fuselage itself, look at the body of, of the helicopter. So you put in uh, new ones, then you take out the wheels, you put in new wheels, Maybe you, you decide to change the wings as well, or go as far as uh, to change the cycle controls in the cockpit. Now that would be functional, okay? And if that was done on the day, then it would create a completely different argument. Mm -hmm. Now, what time did Garang leave um, Entebbe for New Kush? What yeah, was the weather like? Uh, he left around five, um, I think it was 5.02. Uh, that, that's when he left, um, uh, it was supposed to be five shop of course, and you know, he was late by two minutes. Uh, left at 5.02. And uh, the weather according to, uh, to NASA on the day was actually moderate in New Kush. It was not too hot, not too cold. Uh, what they have in the report was that uh, it was around 23 degrees uh, minimum and about 28 maximum. Now, what was the distance between Entebbe to New Kush? At the distance, um, so there were two options. One was 502 kilometers, which was the, um, which apparently was the longest route. Uh, the other one distance of 586 kilometers from uh, Entebbe to Lake Yoga and Bororo. And then there was uh, 502 kilometers from an alternative path via Soroti and flying on Obalang and Abim. That's actually in Soroti. So what they took is they took the longest one. Why did they take the longest route? It is difficult to tell, but if you were to fly on, uh, on Lake Yoga, what then happens is you expose yourself 
to uh, to you know to LRA. You have to remember as well at that time, you know it was not as safe as it is now. So somebody could leak out information that you know there's, there's a VIP flying here, and all you have to do, if you don't have the capacity to put in the bomb into the plane, all you have to do is position yourself somewhere with, with the rocket launcher and actually bring the plane down. So they do not want to take the risk. That's what they say. So the best route was northeast. And apparently it was not as safe as they had anticipated. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the helicopter itself, let's just discuss that briefly. How much weight could be accommodated on the helicopter? Uh, I think it depends. It depends. And uh, that's, that's, that would be a very excellent question for the manufacturer. Because as far as I'm concerned, uh, what they had on that day was far less than they would otherwise carry. You have um, a plane that is going at a cruising speed of 260 kilometers. And uh, the altitude is not that high. That's what they decided. And then you have only what, 13, actually 13 passengers, okay? So what you have in, uh, in, in the cargo hall in the clamshell is actually drums of fuel. And drums of fuel, you would not think that they would actually bring down a plane until they explode. So it is reasonable to think that um, there was no weight problem. What was the maximum speed that the, um that the helicopter could be manned? And what was the actual speed that the pilot used? So uh, the maximum speed was 280 kilometers per hour. Well, they calculate that in nautical miles, you can make the conversion. Uh, at 260 kilometers per hour at, at, uh, at a cruising um, um, speed. 260 cruising, 260 would be uh, what you use much, much later after Soroti. Mm -hmm. Because when they were calling him on the ground, uh, it was later detected that he was actually flying at anywhere between 271 uh, to 280. Mm -hmm. So it was just a maximum speed at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think the, his decision was based largely on the fact that as soon as he gets closer to South Sudan, he would have to just, you know, slow down the speed a little bit and cruise it. Now, go ahead and describe to our viewers the incident that occurred leading up to the crash a few minutes prior to the crash as he was now navigating his way towards New Kush. So uh, the argument was that um, when he was approaching New Kush, uh, the weather was terrible. And I'm quoting, by the way, the weather was terrible. He, um, he was overheard on, uh, on the black box saying that, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, there was an issue with you know, you know, with the cyclic controls, there was an issue with the weather itself. So there was a varying degree of communications. But the actual transcript, I, I'm, I'm fortunate I've not been able to, you know, put my hand on it, but it is there. So there were complaints about weather. There were complaints about the attitude, you know, being, um, you know, much, much higher than you wanted to. There was the issue of, um, you know, what was the right direction to take? Should he go left? Should he go right? So there was a constant communication between him and, and, and his co-pilot. And then John Gering was able to actually chip in and ask, uh, you know, he chimed in and asked what uh, the issue was. And, and because I haven't seen the actual transcript yet, uh, I will not say what he said, but apparently he, he made some comments and then the Ugandan was able to respond with a, Afande, uh, which is sir, everything is okay. And um, yeah, but apparently that was when they were coming back. It wasn't when they were going mm -hmm. because they actually tried to land in, in Yukush at least twice, but it did not happen. But that decision was not because the weather was bad. That decision was because the pilot himself was in communication with ground control and whatever they were telling him, was the cause for the ruckus. That's what was causing the inconsistency between should we land or should we not land, okay? So, uh, so many people are, um, if you ask anyone at the moment, they would be so um, adamant that uh, the pilot had a hand 
in this. Mm -hmm. Now, but, earlier you mentioned that NASA stated that the weather was fine. Now you're morning. telling us that, okay, the pilot was complaining that the weather was bad. Yeah. Now, could it have just changed dramatically and caused no. visibility problems? No, there's no way. There was no way that was the case. Because if you, whatever you're seeing, he is the first person who is able to tell whether the weather's good or not. It's not the ground control in Entebbe. Mm -hmm. The role of the ground control would be to tell him if he has got a problem, he reports the problem, and then they are able to respond to it. But the initiation of the conversation was coming from Entebbe. It wasn't coming from him. Okay. So his job was, no, you know, I see what I see. Uh, I see the weather's clear. So why should I turn back? So apparently uh, there was um, a, a decision that was made uh, at the last minute. Somebody had to create confusion to a certain degree, because as far as I'm concerned, Eunice, I do not believe, and from what I've gathered, I do not believe there was a weather issue at all. There was only the problem of the pilot not being told what to do. Mm -hmm in order to land a plane, it was being told what to do, which was something entirely different. Mm -hmm. Now you mentioned that they circled twice yeah. around the new Kush site. Yeah. And yeah. then the pilot made the decision to go back to Uganda. Yeah. So talk about that decision and what happened after. So, so when they were, um, when he decided that what he had to do was to move back, uh, to, to, to actually fly back to Uganda, uh, it was already past you know, seven, I think it was maybe 7.05 uh, p.m. And, you know, imagine a situation where, okay, you have new push at your back. So what are you facing? If you are facing to your left, the new push, you are going to the Kenyan border. If you go slightly uh, towards the east, you're going to Uganda. And that's, so that's where it was flying to. The idea was that it was not so much about what was the right direction. It was so much about uh, what is the right path because the peaks are very uneven. Mm -hmm. Some are higher than others. Some are you know, slightly more flat. Uh, so he was trying to find a path there. And so you could- mountains, get, were there mountains? Uh, it, it's, not, it's not mountainous as, as such, but, but there's a discrepancy. You can imagine a man who's already confused and all he, all he has to do now is to actually fly back. So when he was flying back, that's where the issue was because that's where they wanted him to be, okay? Because the new push, the, it, it's completely flat, there was nothing. If you want to hurt somebody there, everybody will know. But you drag them out a little bit more, put them where there are mountain ranges, you can have another argument. Mm -hmm. the argument would be that, you know, he made a mistake, mm -hmm. which is what uh, they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. So once he, he was starting to head back to Uganda, what happened? Well, um, so, so there are two theories. Um, one, which I will address now, is that, um, so he was said not to have done enough clearance of the ranges. And the cumulative effect of that is that if you don't clear the ranges, you're gonna slam yourself onto the rocks rather than to the mountains. And if you extend uh, that theory, you would be saying that Peter Nyakairo did not see the mountain, one. He did not know how to detect that there was a higher range here. But that is not the case because it's not the first time. You don't imagine you're going to be in a very flat land where you don't get to see anything. He was always flying. He knows. He knows how to detect these things. So um, the argument that he did not clear the ranges, the decision was made already. He was flying back to Uganda. So what would you be doing at a low altitude when you already know the decision has been made? You're not making the plane. It was already made when you decided to fly from New Cruise. So, um, it's it's not it's not accurate. Mm -hmm. and then what, Actually, is, mm -hmm. what is the second theory? The second, the uh, second theory is that um, uh, the rock bodyguard theory. Uh, the rock bodyguard theory says uh, that uh, Juma Ali Mayen, who was a long term bodyguard, a long time bodyguard of, of John Green, was um, inconsistent in his service, 
that he picked up a gun, shot John Garang, and and uh, and then yeah, that was it. And that it was paid much later. You know, down, down the road, his family was looked after. That they were given money for the service. You know, uh, but it is not true. And that's why I said earlier that you had so many Ugandans, including the pilot, who are professional soldiers. You had uh, five other people here. Uh, you had Obura Maibek. You had another second lieutenant, um, second lieutenant colonel as well. You had uh, and two other guys. So it was impossible that you would shoot uh, South Sudan's, uh, Sudan's more, um, you know, most important son, you know, in the head, and uh, and all other people would be accomplices as well. It is not a possibility. It just could not happen because it did not happen that way. So we have the issue of the pilot error possibility or the rogue bodyguard, as you put it. And the, can you address the Walker, Walter and Miriam um, story and how well, it plays into this? Yeah, yeah. The Walter Bukenya really is, um, is uh, you know, you look, you look at it as, as, as a story that should have been completely separate from what happened. But the Bukenya families did not have a lot of money. They were not, not people of influence. They did not have anything. And it was by sheer luck, by trying to find out something completely different from what I was looking for, that I bumped into somebody who knew Miriam, who had lost a husband on the day that John Green died. Had a story to her, it's not related to South Sudanese at all. It was completely separate. Mm -hmm. But as I tried to find out, okay, so you run a depot at the airport, your husband, her job was to make sure that he brings in the money and all of these things, you know, and that was the business. Okay. And then he loses his life on the day because of course, so you lose somebody for 15 years, you haven't seen him, you can only presume that they're dead now, can you? You know? So when he did not show up at home, she was not able to determine where the husband was. All she knew is there were discrepancies between what he was supposed to be doing and what he actually did on a day-to-day -day basis at the airport. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the report, you mentioned Trader X. Can you describe Trader X? Right, okay. Now, I wanna go back a little bit and, uh, and try to provide some kind of prelude to what happened in 2004. Now, the relationship, you know, you and I know this, and most of the news know, and I'm quite sure your audience are going to be able to identify with this, uh, that there was somebody in the circle of the president, uh, the current president, President Salva Kiir, who was able to provide information to him as to what was going on uh, at John Gunning's camp, as they describe it. Apparently, the argument has it that uh, John Gering was planning to remove Salva Kiir and replace him with somebody much more competent. Uh, one of those people they call the Gering boys and all this. Uh, so the information was not accurate. But Trader X himself was able to peddle on this information. He knew who to talk to. He knew when the information would go out. He knew, you know, when to say it. And for you to be able to do that, you need to be able to identify the weaknesses of the president. And that could be something like uh, uh, the inability to be able to make up your own mind, the inability to look past the information presented to you, uh, the inability to say, okay, this is what I've heard so far, but what are the facts? What is the truth? Because you've been with somebody for 20 years and more. And all of a sudden, just as you're about to open the gates of heaven, the decision is that you think that your position is in, in crisis. Somebody else is going to replace you. Now, somebody with such capacity to pass information to somebody more powerful than him with the belief that this person would believe these things, it's not a regular man, you know? Uh, so uh, there is a list of people, at least seven which we were able to narrow down to three. But 
the reason I particularly decided not to mention names was because pointing fingers in the dark would be construed as um, you know, slander. That's why I open up the gate and say, you know what, it is up to the government now to try and find out because they have an option. On that day, Twitter X was at Entebbe Airport. On the 30th of July, there were just a handful of planes that landed. All the government has to do is to make a decision and say, okay, now what we will do is try and talk to these airlines, get the manifest out, and see who flew in and on what date. You don't even have to have a very you know, um, big scope. You can say 12 days maximum, okay? Because to what I know, those are the critical days. And even the 12 days is, is, is far too much. You have to reduce them only to weekends, okay? So, um, you know, obviously uh, we know who he is, and I can almost tell you certainly that I have an 85% chance that if the president and the government look deep enough, they would unearth him before daylight tomorrow if they're interested. Why do you think the government might be reluctant to go further into investigating the cause of the death of uh, John Garan? You know, that's, that's interesting because um, it's, um, uh, there are two ways to see this. One, is that uh, they want to protect the peace and stability of the country. Uh, that's of course, if you presume that we've ever had any stability and peace anyway. Uh, number two, uh, they would think that the more they do it now, they'll be digging up to my dirt. And, uh, and when that happens, uh, then they would fall into the pit themselves. You see, nobody, no matter how good they are, want to put up their hand one day and admit that they have committed a crime. You know, we can see them in, in with fancy speeches and, uh, and uh, good intents, consolations in burials. But when you go past that, like what are you doing past the headlines? When you go past what you are seeing, uh, it's highly likely that you'll see a lot more uh, than you would believe. So they have the reasons. And I think I do know what the reasons are. Lastly, what would you like the, you know, I would encourage, first of all, our viewers to please go ahead and read this important investigative report. As I'd mentioned previously, it is by Mr. Atem Guy de Dut, our guest for today. And the title of this important investigative report is Secrets in a Flight Manifest the Making of a Traitor. So what would you like the readers to really take from reading this report? Uh, I think for a start, it would just be good to know uh, there is something like that out there. Uh, and then uh, make a deliberate effort to try and read it when you can. If you don't have the time, then uh, at least put up some time much later down the road and say, you know what, I am going to try and find his art. I think the more you make that commitment, the more you will actually read it because it is up to all of us to know the facts. There are people who don't agree with what I did, who think uh, you know, it's too scandalous, you know? uh, why do something like this? But you know, um, if we don't do it, then the problem is on us. We would be a people with no aspirations. We don't aspire for our country to be better. We don't aspire for our, the, you know, the next generation to be better than we are. And we'll be doing a lot of disservice to our people. Mm -hmm. So just go ahead, find out about it, and read it when you can, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you so much for joining us here on Beyond the Headlines. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay.